I do find that one of the biggest things I try to do now to help with the idea generation phase is to try to be bored more often. I think that with all the distractions in our daily lives now, like I can scroll, doom scroll for hours. And so no idea is going to come to you when your brain's processing so much data. So I try to find moments where I, I bore myself. Hey, everybody. I'm Jonathan. Maker, inventor, designer, and Autodesker. Welcome to Shop Talk, the podcast series where we talk to makers, designers, and engineers from shop to shop. Today, I got to talk to Scott Ujan. He's a content creator in the maker design world with an incredible eye for cinematography. If you haven't seen his videos, do yourself a favor. They're amazing. They're beautiful. They're super entertaining. And he also shares a creative process that I think is really valuable to anybody that's in this industry. Can you send me this file? Scott, thanks for coming. Um, I'm a big fan. I've been following your work for a while now, and I've uh, been trying to get you on the podcast. You've been you've been busy. You went to uh, Hong Kong, was it recently? Oh, I went to Taiwan. Sorry, Taiwan. Laser eye surgery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How'd that go? Oh, it was really painful and way longer than I thought it would. But hey, it's all done now. I can see pretty much 2020 now. Wow. And no, you don't need so no more glasses, no more contacts, no more. It's different it's, it's life amazing, now. an amazing time to be alive, isn't it? Yep. The technology's yeah. gotten crazy. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the projects I saw of yours that was, uh, kind of off the wall was the, um, the 3d printed skull, uh, mm. where like you got a, you know, I guess they, they did. Yeah, there it is. Um, you got a, uh, a, yeah, an orthodontic scan. And then you realized that they had, you know, basically 3d scan your skull and then asked them for the file and then you, you know, kind of reverse engineered it, cleaned it up a little bit, and then uh, made this this funny little device. Um, if people aren't familiar with your work, it it, I don't know. Maybe it's not the best place to start, just because it's <laughs> it's kind of like off the wall. But I think it also it shows a lot about your uh, your creative process, and like it's it's such a compelling video too. One of the things I really like <laughs> about your work is how um, the just beautiful the videos are like the the lighting and the editing is interesting and you do all these like you you do stuff in after effects where you're clearly doing like you know stationary camera and then you split the screen and like um i guess it was the last one you did where you see 3d printing in process and then your hand comes in and grabs stuff that's finished but it's still doing this time lapse thing and it's totally seamless you know so thank you um, yeah i love doing stuff like that yeah yeah. And what, can you tell us about that? What, why are you, why are your videos so pretty? There's a lot of people doing this kind of work and they just do kind of bare bones, straightforward stuff. You know, why do you take the time to do that? It started off not with me trying to make something pretty. And honestly, like I think ages ago I was making a video and I was trying to get through this part of the video where I'm making the thing. Cause it's not really about making the thing. It's about what I'm going to do with the thing after I make it. Right. And when I was editing it, I was like, dang, I want to match this to the music. So then it's more satisfying to watch. But then the beat was coming in too early. And so I ended up putting like a fast, like a speed up on that footage and just look terrible because the hands are moving super abnormally and unnaturally. And then I was like, wait a minute, I can just speed up the part of the print and then have my hand come in that regular motion. And if I combine the two things, then I can kind of take out two birds with one stone, show it being printed, show me grab it in normal speed. And then it kind of started from that. And then I was like, whoa, this looks like weirdly magical and like interesting. And from there, it just kind of snowballed into, okay, what other filming te techniques can I do? What other editing techniques can I do to make this process not only faster in storytelling, because I'm always trying to compress things down and make my videos as easy to digest as possible, but then also just like visually more interesting. How can I make this process? Because when you think about, I, I love the making process, right? Like how you go from idea to an object and that process in my mind is a very magical one. And it's so cool to watch other people make stuff. Um, but when you film it, it doesn't feel very magical. So all of a sudden you're talking about six hour long footage of someone just tinkering with something that doesn't feel very, it doesn't feel as magical as it should. At least it shouldn't, it doesn't look as magical as it feels. So the whole goal of like my filmmaking and like what I'm trying to do in these videos is try to capture what it feels like to make stuff, not just, you know, what it actually is in reality. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where it started. And then I just love experimenting with filmmaking techniques as well. So it's just been snowballing and trying different things. And yeah, <laughs> I'm glad so you, you appreciate have a background that stuff. In this. It's just, so you, you just, it's a means to an end. You, you had, you had an idea and then you just put in the, the effort to learn this completely different skill and off you go. 
Sort of. Yeah. I don't want to say I don't fully have a background. Like I used to do a lot of uh, like filming music videos for my friends. I used to make little movies here and there at home just with my brother. And so like I have a little bit of background, but most of the stuff I'm doing in my YouTube now is like things I definitely learned just new just to, yeah, a means to an end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then tell us your, what's your background? How did you get into making stuff to begin with? So my background is um, I went to school at first to be a painter. I went to an art school and then at the art school, they kind of force you to learn other things. And then I got a job in the wood shop for a while and I fell in love with like just making physical things. And I didn't enjoy the painting program too much, to be honest. It's just, it's a weird thing to get taught in an institution. So yeah, I switched over to industrial design, just started woodworking a bunch and I kind of bounced around from there. I tried to pick up anything I could. It's really hard to find like industrial design jobs in Canada where I'm from. And so I tried to just learn everything I could. So I learned a bit of everything and then just took, went wherever there was work. So for a while I did prop design for a while I designed like electronics, medical supplies, and then like just a lot of bouncing around. And then, um, that's basically my background. So just a little bit of everything, but not a pro at anything. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, I, I can say the same for myself and yeah. a lot of the other people I work with at Autodesk and a lot of other people that are, you know, that use fusion to, to do content creation and all that. Um, do you have a day job in, in this, in this arena? Yeah, I do. Right now I work at Google, um, as an interaction designer. So that's like another weird branch that took off where like I was doing industrial design work and I slowly pivoted to interaction. And so, yeah, uh, love my job there. I work on very similar things, but just in a digital space. So, um, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to see, uh, whatever your new projects are that bring that skill into it. Because most of what I've seen from you so far is, um, pretty strictly hardware, right? Oh um, yeah. The, the two like, is very separate actually, to be honest with you. Like I'm never going to bring the digital stuff to my YouTube channel. Probably like I like that work at work. I just, you know, nine to five, I deal with all the digital and interaction based stuff. And then after work, I deal with all the hardware. It's kind of like my escape from the digital side. Yeah, of yeah. So yeah, I keep the two fairly separate, but, um, the thinking and the process definitely goes back and forth. There's constantly things I'm learning from, you know, designing digital things where I'm like, Ooh, this process would apply very well to, you know, the industrial design process or something like that. So yeah, there's, there's a little bit of crossover in terms of that. Yeah. Another thing I saw with your work pretty early on was, I think I actually sent you a message about this, but I noticed in one of your videos that you just had all these beautiful tools. There was like this, it was almost like there was a brand I didn't know about uh, <laughs> that made all these gorgeous black and white, high contrast power tools and hand tools and stuff like that. I sent you this message and I'm like, where, where are you getting this stuff? Is there some company in China <laughs> I don't know you. about? I didn't even this? realize that was a message yeah. from you. Oh my God. That's so yeah. funny. Yeah. 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 And then I you were like, I getting that message. Yeah. And then you said, no, just watch this video. And I realized that you take all of your stuff apart and paint it white and, and, you know, contrast it with black or whatever. Um, and your, your answer for that was so interesting. So good. Would you tell the audience why you do that? Yeah, for sure. Um, once again, it wasn't one of those things, you know, I'm going to grab one right now just to demonstrate yeah. show what we're talking about here. So yeah, all my tools are kind of painted and, uh, you know, just cleaned up and then like I put some labels on them to help me identify them. I have like a tracker system with them that I talked about in an old video. But the big reason why I started doing this is like, if you can look underneath, that's the initial color, right? It was neon green and I have other tools that are other colors. Some are blue, some are black, some are yellow. And so I like to edit fast and I don't love putting things away. I live in an apartment. I do all my projects in my apartment. So the tools are always everywhere. And in one video, very early on, I remember I was editing and I like to edit at a fast pace. So the footage is changing and changing and changing. And then throughout all the changes, my tools are in the background, job, jumping around and visually it was just chaotic, chaotic. And, uh, I'm doing quick cuts. I want you to focus on this thing, but in the background, there's all these colors flashing of the tools moving around my desk and they just, I realized how annoying that is. And so I was like, okay, so either I had to start putting my tools away when I'm filming and like clean up my background every single time, or I can paint them and then have them pop around and you don't really even notice it because it's white. It kind of blends into the wall. And 
I, the reason I went with this too is because I have nowhere to store my tools. So as you can see, I just leave my tools on the shelf. And when I have friends over, it doesn't look like a total mess of all these different, you know, colored power tools lying around my dinner table or whatever. Um, so yeah, this was basically why I started doing it. And I didn't realize it would get that much attention. <laughs> like people are like, oh, this is such a unique look when everyone's asking me for the brand. But it almost makes me feel like there needs to be a brand out there that like hopefully works with me, but basically start producing these like clean looking tools because I did not realize how many people have this exact problem. Like I kind of just assumed most people have, you know, a tool shed or something, but yeah, I guess not. I guess in the modern day, like if you live in a city, it's pretty hard to have a huge apartment to have, you know, tool storage space. So I'm not the only one suffering from this, but yeah, I literally, I'm looking over there right now because I have like another drill on the table and over there I have like my other tools that my glue guns over there. So yeah, it's like, I literally have just tools everywhere around me. And so the white and the blending into the walls really help keep my space looking not too chaotic. <laughs> That's a, it's such a great insight. It's one of the things I really like about, um, talking to guys like yourself is that, you know, we have at Autodesk, obviously we've got a lot of customers that are, um, you know, they're engineers, uh, mm -hmm. industrial designers. Um, they're, they're people that again are specialized, right? You, you stay in that world, you get really good at this thing, whatever this is, mechanical design or me mechanical engineering. Um, and you know, you can get a little myopic and when you've got somebody like yourself that has this other set of skills, that's got like an artist background and, you know, interaction design and all that, you know, you come in and notice things that, um, that I think a lot of people probably wouldn't notice at all. So I think it's really valuable. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it might be that it might also just be because there's there's something about overthinking in design i feel like because one of the stories i don't know if this is true so please fact check fact check me but like one of the stories i heard was that Dieter Rams's influence on braun and design came from a place where like apparently braun's factories were like gonna go bankrupt soon and they just kind of like he was a student at the time and they just let this guy come in and was like hey help us design some last few things and then he did and then those products took off and then they're like help us design more and they just kind of slowly grew into a whole line of products and this guy was a student just coming in just like i guess i have to make this thing and he has to make it work with the manufacturing you know abilities that they had so it wasn't, it was almost like there wasn't a lot of thinking in branding. If there was, maybe there would have been someone in the boardroom being like, it should be yellow. And then it would have all fallen apart. But I think there's something that comes from a place of like just doing it. And then just like, what is the most basic version of it? Let's not overthink a single thing. Let's just make it. Um, and that's, I think, what companies are failing to do now. Like there's almost like too much thinking, too many people in the boardroom with too many opinions and trying to do too much. So yeah, there's something really nice about just, that's kind of what I like about making stuff just in my room too. Like I used to work as an industrial designer and now that I'm not working as an industrial designer, I'm just making these videos. It's like, this is so much more fun <laughs> to not have to think about branding, think about manufacturing, the, where's the logo going to go? Like none of that is even something I have to think about in mind. I can just focus on like, what's something I'd like to use and then like keep it simple, right? Um, yeah, the roots of, I guess, industrial design. Yeah, and you know, 3D printing really enables that whole landscape right? Exactly. You come up with a cool idea. You don't necessarily want to produce the thing and sell it, but you always share your, your files, right? You even share fusion files that have parameters people can tweak and like make it fit your phone perfectly. Yeah. Um, and you know, I know that bamboo labs has sponsored some of your videos, but I also know that watching your reviews of them, that you're being, you know, obviously perfectly candid about the quality of those machines. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Like why, why that brand? You, you probably could have been sponsored by just about anybody. At first, I didn't want a sponsorship. I saw they started sponsoring people and I didn't want one because I didn't have a Bamboo Lab printer at the time. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy one myself because I've just heard so many good reviews about it. And I'm just going to use it on this project. And that video got a lot of attention. And the Bamboo Lab guys are like, hey, so we saw your you use our printer, like, why don't you want to just work with us then? And like, you know, help us mention a few more things in your videos. And I was like, you know what? I think that's okay. I'm already talking about how much I like your printers. Might as well get paid for it. Um, so that's kind of how it started. Uh, I'm still very careful about kind of how much creative control I have over my videos versus them. They are very understanding about that as well. If, you know, they will share their feedback with me, but ultimately like, I just got an email from them earlier today where they're reviewing like, you know, one of the videos I'm about to make soon. And then they're like at the bottom of the email, they're like, Hey, these are just our opinions though. So like you still have full creative control. Uh, feel free to do whatever, how you like to present your things as well. So I appreciate that. That's very rare. Like from what I, the sponsors I've worked with before, oh man, I've had people like rewrite my whole scripts before, you know what I mean? So, so far, I really appreciate the relationship I have with them. 
Um, and genuinely they are making some really badass machines. Like that's the big thing too. It's like, I genuinely love using them. I literally just bought a bamboo lab printer myself for my aunt. She's like really new to 3d printing. She doesn't know anything about it, but she's like, I really want to get into it. Is there a way I can learn it without too much of a, you know, a learning curve. And I was like, start with a bamboo lab printer. Like that was yeah. literally what I said to her. So yeah, uh, I genuinely love the machines and it's cool to get to work with someone that you like. Uh, that's pretty rare. So Exactly. Can you tell us about your your creative process? You know, how do you how do you go about making a project? Your your um your videos do a pretty good job of that, right? Like it's it seems like it's implicit in every video you've got that there's a creative process kind of explanation built into it somehow. But if you could just give us a broad brush, you know, you want to make a new project, how how do you how do you get started? How do you go about that? Yeah, it really depends like when the project idea is already there and I'm just making the video, then it's it's a very straightforward process. I think a lot about the storytelling. And the, wait, where do, where do you want me to begin? Do you want me to begin from the idea part or do you want me to begin from like, once I have the idea, how do I execute it, I guess? No, no, from square one. Square one. So idea generation, pretty yeah. much, right? So yeah. and, then, and then from there, just give us the whole, gotcha, the whole yeah. process. Yeah. <laughs> um, the idea generation part, I hate talking about because it's so tricky. Like ideas yeah. can come to you literally out of nowhere. I do find that one of the biggest things I try to do now to help with the idea generation phase is to try to be bored more often. I think that with all the distractions in our daily lives now, like I can scroll, doom scroll for hours. And so no idea is going to come to you when your brain's processing so much data. So I try to find moments where I, I bore myself. Uh, I go to the shower. I'll take a shower without putting on music, <laughs> you know, go on an errand without bringing my phone with me. Uh, do these things to try to like bore out my brain so it'll come up with ideas and come up with new things. Um, so that's what I do for idea generation now, but it's also just talking to people. I find that like my latest project is my first like collaboration and it was heavily just like me talking to people, making, you know, um, connections with other artists and designers. And then just the ideas that come from those conversations are always very rich. So that's been helping a lot with that. But yeah, once I have an idea, um, I have like, I think many makers have this, but basically a giant list and notebooks full of just like lists and lists of ideas. And I kind of just prioritize them based on what I'm most passionate about. Like, what do I need to exist right now? Um, because I'm doing this part-time, if I don't feel passionate about making something, it's not going to happen. Like, I'm just going to procrastinate. So I always have to just select like the ideas that's like, oh, I want to do this. I would do this if like, I will stay up late tonight to make this happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I have to pick those kind of ideas. And once I pick those kind of ideas, there's two parts to this process. Now there is the making of that thing. And then there is the figuring out the story of how I tell, you know, my audience and how do I present that in the video. So that's the two processes I have now for every project. And making the thing is always way easier just because I come from a background of making stuff. So I can usually do that with my eyes closed and then figuring out the story now is the hard part. So I kind of think about that as I'm making it. I think about, you know, what are the learning outcomes from making it that's worth sharing in the video? What are some things that are too technical that is going to go over most people's heads? Um, so that's what that process is like. The making, the telling the story part is what I'm struggling with the most. And I think every one of us does, right? As makers who are also trying to be content creators, sharing that with the audience, with an audience is super challenging because you can be way too technical. You can be not technical enough. The video can get really boring. So that's the part I'm constantly iterating on and trying to get better as I go. But I, I talk to other people about it. I'll tell my brother like, hey, I was making this thing and I ran into this issue. And I like kind of gauge like, was that interesting? <laughs> and then if he's like, I don't get it, then I'm not going to put it in a video, right? I'll tell my mom about it. I'll be like, oh, I'm making this thing. And I got this idea from here and I'll judge her response. And so I'm constantly just like testing out different narratives in a way and then seeing what sticks with people, what are people interested by. Uh, just as an example, the latest project, the iPhone dock, right? I told my brother and other people about Dieter Rams and I was like, this guy inspired a lot of Apple products. And then they were all like, whoa, really? And then like, they were all really intrigued by that. And I was like, okay, I have to have that in the video then. Because initially that was not going to be in the video. I didn't want to go on the history lesson about Dieter Rams, even though he's super important, I was worried that that's a huge tangent from like me making an iPhone dock. So yeah, uh, it's a very tricky process. I'm still kind of, you know, figuring it out, but that's kind of what I'm doing so far to figure out what's a good story to tell in the video. And do you, is there a lot of sketching going on? Do you tend to jump straight into 3D? How does that work? 
Oh yeah, a lot of sketching. Um, I'm not going to show you any because my sketching skills are actually terrible. Um, the ones you see in the video are the ones where I like cut out a lot of the bad drawings to pick out the good ones because yeah, I'm not actually that good of like a traditional industrial designer. I'm not good at like physical prototyping that well much. I'm not that good at drawing. And, but there is a lot of drawing to figure out mechanisms and figuring out how things are going to work. Uh, but I do jump in CAD earlier than I probably should. <laughs> I'd yeah. say that. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not to. Like, it's so easy to just start modeling and then like start seeing, you know, how things work digitally. So it's kind of how it is now. Yeah. You got to have a uh, prototyping process too. So how many iterations of a product does it usually take for you to get to a point where you're, you're happy with it? As little as possible. Like, yeah. I'm constantly trying to just wing things, to be honest with you. Like I, like I said, right now, I'm a lot more focused on the video side of things, the video making side of things. And so I don't even love like the actual design part sometimes. Um, and it only, it was very recent where I started sharing my 3D models at a massive scale. In the past, I would share them on like Thingiverse and maybe get like a hundred downloads. But lately it's like, oh, I put something out and like a thousand people is gonna get it. And then like, thousands of people are going to message me like, Hey, I had this problem. <laughs> so like, <laughs> so lately I started putting a lot more effort in that front. So I do do more prototyping. Now I have some with me just literally right beside me, but literally recently we were doing like the iPhone dock and there was like different sizes and issues for like certain phones that I was troubleshooting before. Cause we also started selling them. Uh, this is the first time, like I've worked with someone to actually sell one of my designs to, um, from the YouTube channel at least. And just from this prototype, you can kind of see my approach. Um, I need to test out a specific mechanism, right? So I'm cutting out, like I'm not even printing these prints with bottoms, they're just like empty. And I'm just like stopping the print before it even finishes, just so I can test just the mechanism portion. You know what I mean? Let me put the mechanism in there. Oh yeah, here, here's a better example. So this little mechanism. I'm just printing just enough to test the mechanism and that's it. I just shut off the printer. So that's my approach is basically just like isolate the specific things I'm trying to test and then approach doing it that way. Um, give me one second. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. And now the delicate dance of getting exactly back in the right position. <laughs> Dude, your background <laughs> is hardcore. I didn't even realize how many machines are behind you. Yeah, we got it. This is the, this is our um, shop at the uh, Portland office. So I've got a Tormach nice. right here. Um, is this like uh, your lab? Like what's, what is this space? It's just, <laughs> this is well, so yeah. Awesome. So we've, we've got this thing here called the, called the pie shop, right? Okay. Uh, Portland, um, incubator experiment. I think that's what it stands for. Don't quote me on that. Um, my, my colleagues probably know more about that than I do, but we've got this little prototyping shop here and, um, the, the pie shop basically is like a, it's like an incubator. So there's a bunch of startups that come here. Um, and they, uh, they work out of this building and they sort of give us feedback on fusion and we, you know, they obviously cool. get free software and stuff like that. Super cool. Dang. Yeah. I forget, like, I just, I'm in my own little world of fusion and like Autodesk stuff, but I forget it's like Autodesk is massive. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so much stuff. So I always forget that. It's so funny. I want to ask about your favorite project. Can you pick one of the ones you, that people are aware of? What is it about it that you really like? You know what? I'm going to go with my personal favorite project. There's, there's two projects that comes to mind when I think about my favorite. One is like something I made for someone else. And then like when you make something for someone else, it's just so satisfying to like actually help their lives in a way that's tailored for them and tailored for their problem. But I'm going to pick the one where I designed it for myself because uh, I can talk about that a little bit more. But basically my favorite project right now is probably my drawer organizers. So I spent mm -hmm. like almost a whole year just like organizing my drawers. Um, May I just say... So yeah. What a beautiful project. Thank I was you. really impressed by that. I think that might've been the first one I saw of oh, yours. Yeah. yeah Thank just, you so much. man, it's so thoughtful. There's all these little, these little details that just, you know, yeah, it's, I, I can't, sorry to fanboy about it, but oh, no, great work. No, right. great work. I love hearing that. I'm glad that comes across. Cause I don't think everyone saw that project that way. I think a lot of people was like, why would you do that? Or like, what if you got something new? How can you remember all the, you know, the organization? And I think the reason why I love that project is because all the tools that's in this drawer, like some people think I do this with all my drawers. I'm like, there's no way I do that with all my drawers. That's just like insanity. Um, but I just did it with this drawer because these are the tools I literally use. Like maybe, I, I want to say like maybe a hundred times a week. So it was just constantly fumbling for these same objects over and over again. And some people always 
always say, uh, what happens if you replace one of your pens? What happens if you replace? But it's like, no, I'm a seasoned designer. These are the pens I'm going to use for the rest of my life, probably. I don't think I'm ever going to change from those pens I use or like those specific tools. So it's not, I haven't updated it in two years now. It's still the exact same Joe organizer. And the way, the reason it's my favorite project is because I used to love a good wood shop. Like I used to work in multiple wood shops and stuff like that. And there was always that one wood shop where the technicians put in so much effort into the organization of that wood shop. And when you go from that wood shop to a to a cheap membership one, it's like night and day. It's like you're all you're all of a sudden in like just hell <laughs> in terms of like working conditions. It feels more unsafe. Nothing makes sense. Um, and you like cut something and it's not perfect because the jigs suck or something like that, right? And it occurred to me that like we used to spend months like figuring out how we want to organize our wood shops and figuring out the jigs we want to make. And then now that I work at home in, you know, this is my office now, we don't do the same with this environment. We don't spend that much time. We just throw everything in our drawers and like, it's just very little attention to organization and how we take care of our tools too. So when I did that project, it was just for fun. I was just like, oh yeah, I want a better thing for my SD card. And then like that became, well, oh, hey, maybe I'll start designing a thing here for my pens. Oh, maybe I'll start doing it. And it became my whole drawer. But when I finished, I was like, the impact that it had on me was so mind blowing to me where I can just grab things without even looking. I can, my desk is always way more organized because it feels satisfying to put things back into their compartments and just the change it had on my, you know, my daily workflow was wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's such an important insight that comes from the world you're in, you know, interaction design, industrial design. True. Um I think a lot of people tend to think about the world as engineered, right? And that everything it's all it's it's with this the stuff that we enjoy, um the things around us, it's because of engineers. That of course is true, but there's this whole other factor that doesn't come into that discussion which is something you just mentioned it's satisfying to put stuff back in the drawer, right? An engineer would never think about that. An engineer is thinking, you know, how do I fit this volume of stuff in here and, you know, uh, meet these weight requirements and space considerations and so on. But the idea that like, oh, it's satisfying. It makes a little click or it's like everything fits just perfectly in its little place. It's, it's like drawing this desire out of you to do the thing that you should be doing. Right. Um, great insight, man. That's really interesting. 100%, yeah. And that's like something I feel like I love that you related that to like engineering thinking, because I do sometimes feel like that's missing. Like I said earlier, it's about this, like looking too closely at problems. Right. So that's kind of why I think like a lot of, like you said earlier, a lot of the best designers are like Jack of all trades people. And it's because they're thinking about things not too closely. And I think that's really important, but yeah, my day-to-day -day job at Google and in interaction design is all about like designing things for people. And then like people that are very different from one another. Right. And so um, that definitely, I try to bring as much of that into my industrial design process as well. Now I wanted to ask about, you mentioned doing, um, some prop design, mm. um, and there's a, there's an interesting distinction between prop design and industrial design. Yeah. Um, it may be obvious to some degree, right? One is, uh, needs to prov you know, it needs to, um, one needs to provide a function, right? It's got a, it's got a, a thing that it needs to do. Another one in most cases really is just something that needs to be seen on screen. But could you, you know, talk about that a little bit? I don't, I don't think there are a lot of people that have done both of those things. For sure. Yeah. And like, just a quick story from my prop days, like one of the coolest things from my prop days was that I was working on this like bone arrow thing for this show called Dirk Gently. I think it got canceled very quickly, but it was on Netflix for a while. But um, when we were working on that, we had a prop that was made out of foam core that we got from the production team and was like, make a real version of this. And there was foam yeah. core. And I was like, this is the best foam core model I've ever seen. It like <laughs> moved, it had all these mechanisms in it. And when we finished, we threw it in the trash, right? And the day later, my manager, he like grabbed it out of the trash and like left it on the desk. And I was like, oh, sorry, I hit the mic there. Uh, yeah, he grabbed it out of the trash and like left it on the desk. And I was like, why is this doing here again? And he's like, I found out Adam Savage made that prototype. <laughs> and then, like it blew our minds that we're working. Because Adam Savage, I think he like tweeted or something or like just showed something that was like, I made this for Dirk Gently. And now we were like, what? <laughs> and yeah, so it Don't turned throw that out away. <laughs> yeah, it turned out we were working with his product. Like no wonder it was such a good prototype. Um, but yeah. Prop days were super fun, but super stressful. Uh, the prop house that I worked at, they were called IRL Creative and they were just 
so talented. I think what I learned about the prop house was that like everyone was jack of all trades there, but everyone had like the one thing that they were very passionate about that they were just so good at nonetheless, like they, like they developed just a little bit more skill in. Um, but we were a super small team of like, I think we were six at the time. And what that really taught me that was so applicable to YouTube is the fact that because we're not designing things for like mass production, they didn't need to be perfect. And mm -hmm. like, it's, it was all about speed, you know? We would get an order for like a wizard staff and have to make it by the end of the day. And we would need to cast it. And like literally one time we did that and the, an actor sat on it on set and then we had to remake it within a few hours. So it's like, it was constantly this thing about like, what's the quickest way we can do something. And so that's constantly what I'm thinking about too for my YouTube channel. It's like, sure, I can make a mechanism where the button is probably hidden underneath and then it's got a seam line. So you don't even see that there's a button there and all this stuff, but it's like, does that matter? This is a 3D printed object. Like okay. it doesn't require that level of attention to detail. And if you want it to be really easily 3D printable and usable, and then like anyone can make it at home, you don't really want it to be that complicated for someone to have to assemble as well. So that's what prop really taught me. It's like, what's the quickest way to get to something and where are the places you can cut corners on, you know? We would cut corners so much, right? And you know what's funny? One of the things I do in my videos too, is that when I film, the early like in early part in the, early in the video when i'm making the final products right a lot of the footage of me making it isn't actually me making the thing that you see at the final part of the video and because the final part of the video i'm still revising the design and refining it and that's one of the things i learned from prop house too like um when the actor is wearing something the thing they're wearing you can make multiple multiple versions of that prop right you can have like the one that's just seen from a distance we have something we call the hero prop which is the one we film that's the best prop that you film close up and all that stuff and that's kind of how i approach my videos too like the prototype can be seen from a distance it's totally fine to have issues with it and i can start video you know production and all that stuff but then I'll print out like the final version that's perfect, that's used for all the close-ups, right? So yeah, the prop, my experience at the prop house heavily influenced how I kind of approach video making. Such a, cool time. <laughs> yeah, such a great environment for someone to work, to learn to like, yeah, I highly recommend it to any, but like any makers out there. It's just the kind of corners they figure out how to cut and like the way they go about making things is so different. It's, it is awesome yeah it's completely different it's like this this whole world especially if you're used to sort of like the professional design world mm -hmm. you go into the into a, an environment like that with people that have been doing this for a long time and it's just your your head spins it's yeah. amazing how quickly they just run through things they just they have an idea quick solution boom off to this tool here's the thing and like they're they're done in 20 minutes when it would have taken you a couple days if you'd done it your way. Yeah. Like you know? one of the things that I think even influences my design process today, like I designed this thing a while back for like tracking my tools. And at one point in the video, I'm like, Oh, I can design <laughs> this whole holder for holding this remote and all this stuff. Right. But in the video, I remember I was like, or I can just put a piece of magnet on the back of this toy and then use a clip on the thing and then just stick it on there and I don't have to design anything, right? That's one of the things from prop house days where it's like, I remember we needed to design this like sci-fi light thing. And I remember I was like starting sketching. I was gonna start 3D modeling. And then my, my manager guy just goes, hey, I found this light on Amazon. We can just spray paint that silver and then add a little decoration on it and boom, it would be done. And I was like, what? We can just buy <laughs> off the shelf things. And it made me realize it's like, you don't have to design everything from scratch. Like if something else yeah. works, you can just repurpose it. So like it became, um, there's a good, I think they call it bricolage. It's like, can you hear that? Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Jeez. <But> yeah. <laughs> You're good. Um, it's called bricolage. It's like physical collaging. And uh -huh. it's like, that's heavily used in the prop houses. And yeah. Like, yeah. It's, a, it's a very common technique and it's amazing. Yeah. Did you get to think about the, um, uh, the zombie apocalypse question? Oh man, I did. Okay. You want to do that now? Do you need yeah, to let's say do it, it first? Okay. Yeah. So the, the scenario is it's the zombie apocalypse and civilization has collapsed. You've got to rebuild. Um, you can get any tool you want, uh, to rebuild your shop, but you put yourself at great personal risk every time you leave your compound. So what do you get first? Oh man. So like, I'm assuming I still live in my apartment in Seattle, right? Sure. Like I'm not. Yeah. It's funny. I've had that fantasy before in my apartment. Of course, <laughs> of course you have. Like, yeah. Especially during like COVID, I was like yeah. watching some zombie movie, but here's what I thought about. Okay. Here's what I'll do. 
I won't venture very far out. Mm-hmm. Like having watched too many zombie movies, I know like the farther you go, the bigger the risks are. And then if you get to a too good of a spot, like if I go to a metal shop and I take over a metal shop or a Home Depot, it's like other people want to take that over too. So you're just, you know, causing yourself problems. So the way I thought I would do this is basically start taking over other apartments in my floor. You know, slowly get to a place where I have full control of, you know, the floor and then other floors in my building. So that way I can slowly grow and then basically figure out um, how to control my whole building. And there's enough to probably, you know, scavenge from other people's apartments to uh, set everything up. Um, And eventually to the roof where I can start a farm, you know what I mean? And then go from there. Basically super safe and small baby steps. (laughs) Nice. That's probably how I'd approach it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. It's a... What was that movie 28 days later where they go up to the roof? Have you seen that one? Yeah, yeah, I have. That's the movie I watched during COVID that I was like, oh man. <laughs> great movie. Yeah, great movie. Great movie. So good. All right. Yeah, it's it's been good talking to you, man. Can you give us a plug for where you want people to find you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm Scott Ujan on all the channels, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. And uh, one thing I want to plug is uh, Overwork and I started selling those iPhone ducks. So if you want to pre-order one, uh, the link's also on my YouTube channel and all, on all my socials. So yeah, you can check out nice. more of my work there. Very cool. Okay, yeah, mm-hmm. definitely check that out. Thanks for coming, man. Appreciate your time. Hey, I just want to say that really quick. Like, I appreciate you guys asking me to be on this so much. Like, some of my favorite people were on this podcast in the past. Like, you know, I watched a bunch of the other episodes. Zach Friedman was on this. I was like, oh, man, that's so cool. So, yeah, I really appreciate you reaching out, Jonathan. Oh, sure, man. No, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of your work. I think people are really going to like this. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, you make, you make great stuff. It's super entertaining. It's really fun. It's inspiring. Like, this is... I'm good. Thanks for coming, man. It's, it's a favor to us for sure. Oh man. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Hopefully people like it. <laughs> hey everyone. Don't forget to like comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all things shop talk. If you're ready to try fusion through yourself, find the link in our description.